Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sangeeta Chaudhary and I welcome everyone to my lecture class again. In my today's class, I am going to discuss about hyperkalemia which is one of the very important electrolyte imbalances which we should know about. I will discuss about the causes, approach, diagnosis and treatment of a case of hyperkalemia. Now let's see what is hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia means serum potassium concentration above 5 mL per litre. But some book will say more than 5.5 mL per litre also. The normal value of serum potassium is in between 3.5 to 5 mL per litre. Now there is something known as pseudo hyperkalemia. What is pseudo hyperkalemia? As the name suggests, pseudo hyperkalemia means there is an artificial rise of serum potassium without any real hyperkalemia. It may be as a result of hemolysis or it may be due to marked leukocytosis or thrombocytosis. Lysis of leukocytes or thrombocytes would result in release of intracellular potassium into the serum thereby leading to an artificial rise in the serum potassium level. Due to some technical errors also there may be pseudo hyperkalemia. For example, repeated fist clenching while taking the sample for uh, serum potassium measurement it may result in pseudo hyperkalemia. Now let's see what are the causes of hyperkalemia. The causes may be divided into three groups. One is transcellular shift of potassium and the other one is increased potassium load and very importantly reduced renal excretion of potassium. Now about the transcellular shift, transcellular shift means shift of potassium from the intracellular fluid to extracellular fluid. Now, what are the causes of this shift? The shift may be due to increased serum osmolality, which may be result as a result of use of mannitol. In cases of metabolic acidosis, insulin deficiency, due to use of certain drugs like digoxin, beta blockers, succinylcholine, as a result of hyperkalemic periodic paralysis and vigorous exercise. These are the causes which leads to shift of potassium from inside the cell to outside. Now, increased potassium load rarely results in sustained hyperkalemia until and unless it is associated with some other precipitating factors for hyperkalemia. Reduced renal potassium excretion is prob probably the most important cause of hyperkalemia. If we talk about the symptoms of hyperkalemia, most important symptoms are cardiac symptoms. The patient may present with cardiac arrhythmias, may it be uh, ventricular arrhythmia or atrial arrhythmias. The patient may have syncope, dizziness, even patient may present with sudden cardiac death. Hyperkalemia causes muscle weakness because it causes partial depolarization in the muscle which ultimately leads to muscle weakness and if it involves respiratory muscle, the patient may present in a severe condition with respiratory failure also. Now, how do we diagnose a case of hyperkalemia? We have already discussed from the serum potassium level, we can know if the patient is having hyperkalemia or not. Other than serum potassium level, we can look at the ECG findings of the patient. There are certain typical ECG findings for hyperkalemia. They are like tall and peaked T wave, wide QRS complex, absent P wave and sine wave pattern. What is sine wave pattern? In cases of severe hyperkalemia, the QRS becomes so much wide that it merges with the T wave, ultimately resulting in a sine wave pattern. So these are the very important ECG findings from which we can diagnose a case of hyperkalemia. Now, if we talk about the diagnostic flowchart of hyperkalemia, we can discuss this. Once we know that the patient is having hyperkalemia, uh, we need to know if it is a case of pseudo hyperkalemia or not. If it is a case of pseudo hyperkalemia, then no further workup is needed. And if the serum potassium concentration is more than or equal to 6 at presentation, we directly need to go ahead with the treatment of the patient because this is a very emergent condition. Now, if there is no pseudo hyperkalemia and serum potassium concentration is below 6, then we may go ahead with history, examination and necessary test. Okay, after history and examination, if we find that this is a case of transcellular shift, then we need to treat accordingly as per the causes of transcellular shift. And if we think it is because of increased potassium load, which is rare to cause sustained hyperkalemia, we will treat the patient accordingly. Now, if there is no evidence of transcellular shift or increased potassium load that may 
that uh, hyperkalemia may be due to reduced urinary excretion of potassium. How do you know that there is reduced urinary excretion? If we can measure the 24 hour urinary potassium and if it is below 40 millimole per day, that means there is reduced urinary excretion of potassium. Now, if we measure the urinary sodium and if it is below 25 millimole per liter, that means there is reduced distal sodium delivery, which is leading to hyperkalemia. Then we need to measure the TTKG, that is transtubular potassium gradient. What is the formula of measuring TTKG? This is urinary potassium multiplied by serum osmolality divided by serum potassium multiplied by urinary osmolality. So we using this formula, we can calculate the TTKG or transtubular potassium gradient. Now, there may be two scenarios. In one scenario, TTKG more than 8. In the other scenario, TTKG less than 5. If TTKG is more than 8, that means or that suggests that there is reduced tubular flow which may be as a result of advanced renal failure. If TTKG is less than 5, that means there may be two conditions. One is reduced aldosterone, which may be as a result of primary adrenal disease or hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism, for example, in case of type 4 renal tubular acidosis, or it may be as a result of resistance at the level of aldosterone receptors. Okay, so this is how we evaluate a patient of hyperkalemia and we try to find out the cause of hyperkalemia. If we talk about the treatment of hyperkalemia, there are multiple options we have to treat hyperkalemia. First of all, calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate reduces the membrane excitability, thereby it can cause or it can result in stabilization of the cardiac muscle cells which will prevent the fatal arrhythmias so how do we administer calcium gluconate we need to administer 10 ml of calcium gluconate 10 percent solution and we should administer it intravenously over two to three minutes the action lasts for around 30 to 60 minutes within 5 to 10 minutes of administration of calcium gluconate we need to recheck the ecg and if there is resolution of ecg finding we may need to repeat the do may, may not repeat the dose but if there is no resolution of ecg finding then we need to repeat the dose after 5 to 10 minutes again now insulin we already know that insulin causes intracellular shift of potassium. That means it causes shift of potassium from outside the cell, that is from the extracellular fluid to inside the cell or in the intracellular fluid. So we may give 10 or 20 units of insulin with either 25% or 50% of dextrose respectively. And if the patient is having hyperglycemia, we may not give in dextrose, we need to give only insulin. Third option is sodium bicarbonate, but sodium bicarbonate we should be giving only if they receive severe hyperkalemia associated with metabolic acidosis. And how do we administer? We need to administer around 3 ampoule of soda bicarb in 1 liter of 5% dextrose. Next option is beta 2 adrenergic agonist. For example, we can use salbutamol 10 to 20 milligram over a period of 30 to 60 minutes as continuous nebulization. So we need to do a continuous nebulization for 30 to 60 minutes with salbutamol 10 to 20 milligram. And the action lasts for 2 to 4 hours. So we may need to repeat the nebulization. If you talk about the long term treatment, we need to uh, increase the distal delivery of sodium. Distal so sodium delivery can be increased by infusion of saline or by use of diuretics. Now, there is something known as cation exchange res resins. For example, sodium polystyrene sulfonate. It will exchange sodium in, uh, uh, in place of potassium in the GIT. And the dosing is around 25 to 50 gram, which should be given with 100 ml of 20% sorbitol. Why sorbitol? To prevent constipation. Finally, dialysis may be required in patient with severe renal failure or if the patient is unresponsive to other conservative management, then the dialysis is the only option. 
and we need to advise the patient to avoid potassium rich food so what are the food uh, foods which are rich in potassium for example banana orange coconut water they are very much rich in potassium tomato potato spinach they are also rich in potassium so we need to advise the patient to avoid taking this group of food to prevent hyperkalemia okay so this is all about hyperkalemia which i wanted to discuss and very importantly treatment of underlying disease is very important okay so not only the correction of potassium level but also treatment of underlying disease we need to uh, keep in mind and we need to take care of that okay thank you so much for attending the class i hope it